Hello. Oh. Hello. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to Estrad. I also want to say welcome to our two speakers, Roberto Verganti and Osa Öberg. In a few minutes, they will let us know why innovation, uh, in, thinking inside the box is, box is most important for innovation. Uh, but first, I want to say a few words about ESPRI, the organization that arranged these lectures. My name is Helen Thorgrimsson and I work as a project manager at ESPRI. We disseminate research results to a wide audience. On our website, you will find uh, almost 100 uh, earlier arranged lectures via web TV. And you will find uh, our magazines, Antre, as PDFs, a lot of articles and other interesting things about innovation, entrepreneurship and small business. Today's lecture will start in a minute and after about 35 minutes we will have a fika break. Then coffee, tea and uh, cinnamon buns will be served in the bar outside this room. And uh, when we are back here, after about 20 minutes, uh, Osa and Roberto will let you do a creative exercise. And before we stop at five, there will also be time for questions. I would like to thank our main partners, Tillväxtverket and Vinova, uh, and also Entrepreneur Magazine, which is our media partner. That was all for me. The stage is yours. <clears throat> Thank you, Helene. I love cinnamon rolls, so I look forward to that. Um, many years ago, I um, worked together with a manager called Magnus, and he was working in a paper pop company. And uh, we were trying to help him to design a new package for wine. Uh, they are called bag-in-box packages. And at that time, they were quite new. And Magnus said, uh, I would like to create a nice box, a box that can stand on the table uh, on the Friday night uh, when you have dinner. It should be nice and attractive to look at. So he said, mm, I need to engage my team. Let's try, to be, let's try to think new. Let's try to think outside the box. He said. And um, his team were, they were quite happy. Yeah, ideas. I don't know if you recognize yourself. Let's try to think about new things. And everyone had a lot of ideas, came with a lot of energy, and they compared their ideas, they combined the ideas. They came up with a lot of new, uh, good, great stuff. And um, one day he came to me and said, Oasa, you know what? I put out a challenge on our website to ask for ideas from the users, you know, what could we do with this package? And he was very proud and he said, we have got 150 ideas, yes! Super happy. Um, but the next minute, second, he turned quite serious and devastated. And I said, so, what, what, what minus, what's the problem? And he said, uh, he was quiet, turning and twisting a bit, and then he said, we don't know what to do. There are so many nice ideas. We don't know which one to pick. Where should we go? What is the direction we should take? And I remember this. And at this moment, I was also concerned because apparently they had been doing everything according to the handbook and the processes of innovation. They had been gathering uh, people, looking at users, asking for others to help them with ideas. Uh, but it looked like they were more confused than convinced about what to do. And uh, I didn't know what to answer. I didn't know what to say. So this was my entry back to the university to do my PhD on innovation management and, and meaning. Because I felt that somehow when we have to take decisions like that on what package to choose and develop and market and sell and make people happy, you need to, f you f you need to feel, feel good. And meaning in combination with that was something that intrigued me. So I've been um, a PhD at Mellandalen University in Eskilstuna for five, six years, but mostly been working with a research team in uh, Italy, in Milan, in Politecnico. 
So, which leads me to introduce my colleague. Please, Roberto. Thank you. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, um, my name is Roberto Reganti. I work in a university in Italy. His name is Politecnico di Milano. It's the largest and uh, eldest technical university in Italy. Uh, in reality, I work in the business school of Politecnico. And I teach a course whose title is uh, Leadership and Innovation. And I've been intrigued by innovation in the last 10, 15 years. And when I met uh, Osa a few years ago, maybe more than a few years ago, almost 10, uh, but in, in a conference, uh, the word around us looked more or less like this. The word innovation basically looked like, you know, it's, we live in a dark world. And uh, in this dark world where, you know, it's difficult to find solutions, suddenly someone comes up with an idea. So if you think about what's the classic symbol of innovation, if you think about a cover of a book of innovation, I would say 90% of the time you will find a light bulb there. Because the symbol of innovation in our society is to be innovative, you need to have ideas. However, nowadays we don't live anymore in a world like this. We live in a world like this. Isn't it? In the last seven years where we have been working together, doing projects with companies, we never met one single company who told us we don't have ideas. We haven't done a creative workshop, we haven't done anything like this. They, sometimes they say we, don't, we still miss the idea. Like to say, you know, we have a lot, a lot of ideas, but I don't know why, there is another one there that still escapes us. And most of the time, in reality, the idea is already there in front of the eyes. It's, it's very difficult to recognize it. Actually, the more light there is, the more it's difficult to recognize it. So, when we started to do research, and when I, when I started, when it was a long time ago, uh, 15 years ago, it's true, the world looked like this. But we cannot think about innovation anymore in this way. Because the world nowadays, in 2017, is different. And there are three reasons why the world is like this. The first reason is that we live in a society that is much more creative. The number of people who is creative is increased. There is a popular book by a sociologist whose name is Richard Florida. Uh, Richard Florida has been done a study and published a book a few years ago titled The Rise of the Creative Class. And it says that 30% of the population, especially in urban areas, belong to the creative class. 30%. I mean, we belong to the creative class, you belong to the creative class. We don't live in a society anymore like in the 80s and the 70s where more people belong. Most people belong to the blue collars. They were working in factories. In our society, a lot of people is creative. So the number of people is creative is increased. We have better tools because of research, because of a lot of things I've been doing in the last 15 years. We have better tools to be creative nowadays. And especially the m most important reason why we live in a world like this is because of the digital transformation. Nowadays, it's very easy to access ideas wherever they are. So, this is a photo of, uh, taken in 2011 in the Gulf of Mexico. I don't know if you remember, in, in 2011, in the summer, in the Gulf of Mexico, there was a big explosion in an oil rig, and a few people died. And then the oil kept spilling off the rig. They couldn't stop it. So, after a few weeks, I remember the newspaper was saying, oh, still the oil is going out. It was the biggest disaster in history environmentally. And, and then the guys had an idea. Why don't we set up a website so that whoever in the world has an idea of how to stop this spill, they can propose it. So they put up this website, and in a few days, they collected more than 20,000 ideas for free, including one idea from Scarlett Johnson, <laughs> which we don't know why she had an idea of how to stop. But anyway, <laughs> it's for free. It's for free. So we, we, we don't have a problem of getting ideas anymore. There are websites, the most popular one is Innocentive, website where companies can go there, post the problem. Innocentive have a community, more than 300,000 scientists around the world can go there and propose solutions. In the world of design, there is a website called Design Booms. Company can go there, search for a new package. They get 
on the average, 4,500 ideas by design students for free. A few years ago, IBM did a massive brainstorming with the software, which is called Idea Management, you know, and they got, in a few days, more than 150,000 participants. We don't live in a world that is dark. We live in a world where we are blinded, but we are blinded not because it's dark, but we are blinded because there is too much light. So the idea of this seminar is not to talk about innovation like 15 years ago. It's to talk about innovation now, in this moment. And this moment, innovation looks like this. How can we be innovative in a world that is blinded and overcrowded by ideas? So, Roberto, given we talk about light and we are in Sweden, let's light up the light. <laughs> I hope you will stand this because I think it's vanilla. Yeah. So we can go maybe a little down with the light and try to see if we can make the environment a little more relaxed because we are too much blinded by ideas. Thank you. <laughs> and... and uh, no, I, I'm Italian. I'm quite intrigued by the way Scandinavians uh, play with candles and, and they make the environment very cozy. M music. Music. <laughs> Can music. I say Hygge? That's Danish. That's Danish. That's Danish. So I cannot say that. Okay. <laughs> music. Uh, I'm Italian, so we don't really. I mean, it, 30 years ago, if I went to my mom and I asked, you know, Mom, do we have a candle at home? Yes, we have one one candle, because you know, in case the power goes off, because the electricity in Italy is not working very well. But anyway, in case the power goes off, we have a candle. Okay, actually we had two because we were Catholic, so we also had the candle, you know, with the Madonna, and, and, but that was not supposed I to be. I don't know if we know uh, the Madonna. The Madonna, <laughs> it's the mother of Jesus. Yeah. So, I mean, anyway, we take the class another time. Uh, anyway, it's, it's uh, so that, uh, that was uh, the only candle we had at home. I mean, Nowadays, if I go to my mom, I say, Mom, what happens if, if the light goes off? And she does this, and then she has a phone, so, uh, and, and so we don't need candles anymore, isn't it? And yet, if I go to my mom nowadays, Mom, do we have a candle? Of course, we have dozens of candles. When we go there, and I'm going there with my children, and she's waiting for us with a nice polenta on the table, there are a lot of candles there. Of course, not in case the power goes off, for a different reason, to welcome us in a very cozy, fragrance, nice room. And it's, what is amazing is that if you look at the industry of candles, in reality, the industry of candles in the last few years has exploded. If you look at the data, the budget spending of families in candles is much higher than the budget spending on light bulbs. What is interesting, however, is that this new trend of growth in the industry is not led by companies like Dilly Holmans, which if you go to Italy, no one knows. Probably in Sweden, I suppose, is a company that probably... I, I, but, but it's not very well known around the world. But if you go around the world, there is a company like this. This is called Yankee Candle. I know that for a Swede, this is a disaster. I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry. But if you go to Italy and you go to my mom, she can spend even, I know it's crazy, but this candle can cost 30 euros. Mm. Okay? And Yankee Candle is it's a kind of startup in the industry because it's been founded in the 80s by a young child who started to do this thing for his mom. And, uh, and eventually now it's leading the world market in, in, in premium candles. They have almost 50% of the market share worldwide of candles. So and how is it possible that other companies that were in the industry before, they totally missed the point? What is happening here? Which is very interesting. And especially in an industry that should have disappeared because why people buy candles. So, this company here, I, you, I don't know if you've you ever seen this in Sweden, and probably the competition here is too strong. It's like selling refrigerators to the penguins. I mean, you can't sell candles to... to. Uh, anyway, uh, it's... it's uh, imagine, imagine you're a company like, like Lily Holman. Uh, you do this brainstorming exercise. You produce ideas. And I'm sure you can have thousands of ideas about how to innovate candles. Also, explain me that there is a candle, probably this one, that... You can even do holes in the, inside the candle so the, the wax doesn't go on the, on the 
tie able yeah. to. <coughs> As you we can have, do yeah, Robert, it's because we have wooden houses in Sweden and, and we, we have a lot of lights fire. at Christmas and we forget the lights on and there are a lot of fires. So that's a safety Safe. solution to take the wax inside the candle, not all over the table. So you can imagine, you can do a lot of innovation yeah. here. But if in this company someone comes up and say, why don't we do a candle in which the, va the wax is inside a jar and then we put the big label around in paper so you can't see the flame. <laughs> okay, so you can have this idea, but if you're not searching in the right direction, even if this idea is in front of you, you will never see it. So all this example is to come to a framework that we follow us in this, the next hour and a half, which is this framework that says that when people use things, solutions, can be a product, can be, I don't know, it can be a service, can be whatever, an experience, people use or buy solutions. They do it because there is a reason, there is a why. Mom, do we have a candle at home? Yes. Why? No, in case the power goes off. That's the why. That's the meaning of a candle for my mom 30 years ago. Tool in case the power goes off. You, and you can do a lot of innovation to improve a candle to illuminate better. What Yankee Candle has done is not an innovation just here. They have moved innovation one level higher. They have been changing the reason why you buy a candle. Not because in case the power goes off, but because I want to welcome you in a fragrance room. Okay? So there are two levels of innovation. I mean, we are not inventing anything here. It's very simple. There are always, whatever you do things, there are always two things. One way is to say where you want to go, why you do things, and that then there is a level, okay, once we have decided where to go, how we get there. Okay, nothing special. People use things, and there is a why. This why is the meaning. There is always a meaning, there is always a purpose in what we do. Well, we can also say that meaning is connected to experience, of course. If you want to define meaning just like this, it's quite tricky because, of course, meaning is different to all of us and it changes. What is meaningful for me or you today might not be so meaningful in 10 years or tomorrow. Uh, but if you look at meaning and you go to the dictionary, you will see that meaning can be defined in many ways. Both in English and Swedish, we have three, four definitions of meaning. The one we talk about now is not what we use in Swedish when we talk about meaning, which is a part of a sentence, a gra grammatical part of a sentence, of course. But it's the fourth one there, the quality or sense of purpose that makes you feel that your life is valuable. So, purpose or why. Uh, we have been talking a lot about the candles and lights now, so we will uh, give you two more examples about meaning and meaning change and how certain companies manage to see something new, a new meaning into something existing. So, uh, I will be a little bit boring now because I will talk two seconds about saving money. Um, I mean, when you were a child, I had a little uh, piggy bag, spa gris, I don't know what you call it. A little pig where I put my money that I got from my grandma, the coins. And my father said, you should put them there and save them for something. And okay, this was fun, but it was also a little bit painful to put the money there and save them. But you know that you should save some money. Uh, then you, you grow up and you start to live on your own and you continue to save money because it's a good thing to do and um, you get these white A4 sheets uh, home in the mail with black digits that says this is your money, this is the interest rate and you see that has, there's been a change. Um, and this, there are websites like this, for example. You can see where you should put your money and what are the interest rates, what are the conditions, mm, which one should I pick. And it's nice and well organized. Uh, but I think it's a bit boring. <laughs> That's me. Uh, so you could ask yourself, is there another way to think about saving and saving money? Could it, 
could there be something else than just, just saving it because your father told you so? Uh, this, this is a Swedish example of another way to think about saving money. It's called dreams. Have you heard about it? Yeah? So I will try to explain it a little bit fast here. So the, the idea with dreams is that first of all you set a goal. I would like to go to Burma and bike. Hmm, it will cost me this many money. I will have to save 20,000 kroners. Okay, you set the goal because you would like to do something. You have a dream. Then you start to save to get there. But you have a purpose. So when you have a purpose, it's easier to sacrifice your, yourself a bit. For example, instead of eating out, like I always did before, spending 75, 85 kroners on the lunch, uh, I will cook at home tonight, and I will bring my food to the office, and I will eat there. These 75 crowns that I'm saving, I will swish them. I don't know if you say swish in Italian, but you transfer this money to your Burma account. And over time, you see how the scale goes up, and you get a little bit closer to your Burma biking. Because you cooked at home, or you didn't buy coffee like I do, on the way to the train. No, every, every day I do the coffee in the office. I don't buy coffee and bring on the train. I, I try to save and I switch the money away to something that feels more meaningful. Um, and the, the nice, the interesting thing here is that the guy behind this, the Swedish guy behind Dreams, Henrik, he used to work at one of these companies. So he said to us, no, I had this idea. I talked about it, it was there, the idea was there, but no one really took it, picked it, did something with it. So I had to start my own company and do this. Which is, uh, if, I can, if I may, so it's really an, a, an example of the innovation we saw before. It's not just another solution, it's a new meaning. To the point that in this application, the interest rate doesn't care anymore. I mean, all the other can compete on how can you have a better interest rate and, you know, make the cost lower. So you can have a lot of innovation about different ways of saving. This instead takes a totally different direction. Who cares about the interest rate? What is important is your dream yeah, and how you get there. Yeah, and it's like saving without the purpose, just, just saving, to sa saving for a certain purpose that is super clear, so clear that I can mm -hmm. avoid to buy my favorite coffee every morning as I used to do. As a change of meaning instead of being a change of solution. Mm. Okay. Uh, we take one more example, isn't yeah. it? So, uh, and this is an example that is a little bit emotional, emotional for me, but I will do it anyway. And it's about beds. A few years ago, we uh, were doing a project in Poland with um, a nice Polish man called Piotr. And uh, he had many clients that had been staying for him for a long time. They were very loyal, but they were turning old. And he said, I would like to do some nice furniture for these long-term uh, clients that have been staying from, with me so long. Um, okay, we discussed back and forth what kind of furniture, but we decided to work on beds. Because what we realized is that when you become old or senior, and maybe you're sick somehow, you need to rest, it tends to be that you stay in bed, in your bedroom, a little bit far from the others. The bedroom is quite a private place, isn't it? So you stay there in bed and you feel a little bit lonely. And um, I always think about my father, because my father turned sick very fast. And he had to be home. And we got the hospital bed at home, these iron beds with a triangle on top. And it was put on the second floor in my parents' house. And there was my father in the bed, totally tired. But he was there alone. Downstairs, me and my sister, grandchildren, everyone was there doing the food, fixing the things. But he was not there with us because he was tired. And um, he didn't like this triangle. He, he was a sports guy. He liked to do a lot of sports. But he, he had to be there. So in the end, we took the iron bed down the stairs. I don't know who did that. But we did, and we put it in the kitchen, kitchen living room downstairs, so he was staying with us there. 
so what did we do with this Polish project then? This was the result. Uh, this project is called, and the product is called, the living bedroom. Do you see the bed? The bed is here. So this bed was designed to create another experience, another meaning, the meaning of I'm socializing, I'm participating, I'm part of this, even though I might have to rest. Uh, if you look at it, you see the bookshelves there, more the, the feeling of a, of a living room. And you can't see it now, but you can also take down a, a screen to watch movies or TV. Um, that is also more a living room feeling. There are curtains there that you can also close if you really want to have silence and be protected. And some extra drawers for your medicine, private things. Also this rig on the side there is if you want to try to exercise, exercise a bit, but not feeling so miserable with having the triangle hanging there on top of your head. So this project came out as a result of trying to change the experience of a bed when you're senior elderly. And it went to the market. And it's very successful. Also, young people want to have it, um, even though it was uh, designed for seniors. Uh, now we've been talking a little bit about meaning and giving you some examples connected to products and the user, the client. But meaning is also something that is very, very important for employees in organizations. So if you have a, your company and you have a lot of employees in front of you, you also have to think about meaning. You cannot leave that out. Uh, this is a survey we did with almost 4,000 employees, asking them what is important for you when you think about your career, where to work. And of course, salary was important for everyone, and uh, especially to all the group, the dark green bar, a little less important for the executives. But meaning came a second. So if I don't find this work meaningful, I don't know if I want to stay. And you see this especially among millennials, younger people who really have this feeling that it has to be meaningful, otherwise I, it's complicated for me to stay and work there. And for, especially for the executives there, the, the light green bar on the second uh, section there, meaning is increasingly important. So, coming back to our framework, what we have been saying is that when we think about innovation, we can think about innovation at two levels. One is the level of the solution, and the other one is the level of meaning, the how and the why of things. Okay? And most of the handbooks of the last 15 years have been focused on how, so having better ideas to solve problems in a better way. I'm not saying that the solutions are not important, of course. Having ideas is still important. But nowadays, having ideas is very easy. Actually, it's too much. It's too easy. Anyway. The problem is that in a, in a world full of ideas, what is becoming, the more you increase the number of ideas down there, the more finding the right direction becomes very important. So the big channel of innovation nowadays is not anymore about finding the solution. It's what is the right direction we should go. Because most of the times, the ideas in front of you are in the sea. Like in the example of uh, Dreams, the application you were seeing before, the idea was in front of the banking organization, but they couldn't see it because they were looking for a solution for better interest rates. And why we go into a new direction of meaning, like in this case of finding, you know, saving for a purpose, because the world has changed. Because nowadays, young people, I mean, in a world where the interest rate, as much as you want, but the interest rate is so low, of course, people, and people have much more problem to save nowadays. Young guys are much more interested in a way to get to a dream rather than putting their money where, where you don't know what to do. Because in any case, whatever the creativity you can get there, the interest rate is low. So a lot of people in that industry were doing innovation at a lower level. This company come out with a totally new direction. And what we have been discovering in the research in the last few years is that the big challenge of innovation is moving up there, and if you solve it, then you make a real difference. 
So that was the first part of our investigation. Why, what can you do when, you, when, when the world is full of ideas? Well, when the world is full of ideas, the point is to move one level higher, understanding the direction. Because the idea is for sure already there. In our world, every time you think I have an idea, be sure there is in 7 billion people, there is for sure someone else who already had the same idea. And maybe even within your organization, most likely. The point is that you need to find, have the light lenses to see it, that you have to look in the right direction. So how do we get there? The second part of our study was, OK, how do we find a new direction then? So uh, we, we work in a business school. So the only way for us to do research is to work with organizations. I mean, we cannot create a laboratory in our university with people inside and do experiments. The only way to do research in management is to work with real organizations. So this is a few organizations we have been working in the last seven years from different industry, uh, from, you know, this is products, these are more services, business to consumers, business to business, because the problem of finding the right direction, finding a meaningful direction, it's in an industry. Of course, we have been using a lot of examples that are more popular on consumers. But there are, of course, meaning and direction, whatever you do. And also a few companies in Sweden. And what we do, we, we do studies, we write articles, and then after we write articles, the companies approach us and say, can we do this together? And so on. And over the seven years, we have been slowly, slowly, slowly uh, trying to understand how this process works. And we will share this together. I will show now just a little example of what we will do later. I mean, you don't do innovation in half an hour, so no worries. <laughs> it would be so nice, but uh, unfortunately. So we will just give a little hint of what can happen. But basically, this process consists of four practices. Okay? And these four practices, the first one we call it awakening, which is basically means, first of all, whenever you do innovation, you need to be aware of the need to change, otherwise you will never do it. So how do we get engaged into an innovation process? The second one we call preempting, which means before even starting to talk to user, customer, before that, you start from yourself. When you move at the level of meaning, instead of starting from the market, you start from your interpretation of how the world is changing. Third, criticizing, which means instead of having more ideas, when you move one level higher, at the level of meaning, the big point is, how can I see things in front of me in a new way? I don't need to put one more light bulb there. It's a trick of being critical and see things in new ways. And the fourth one is embodying, which means when you go to a process in which you slowly change direction, you cannot change direction hoping that the organization changes, but you stay there. You need to change yourself. You need to embody the change. You need to change as well. So we'll go through this process later. No, I'm just thinking, Roberto, and, and I've heard this many times, that isn't it so that there are already quite a lot many innovation processes? We saw uh, before that there is a lot of books about innovation with light bulbs on. So I'm thinking, do we, do we really need another process? Uh, that's, that's a very good point. Uh, we practiced before, so this, I was waiting for this question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I hope, I hope it was correct. <laughs> yeah, it was perfect. Thank you. Take it. <laughs> I take this. And, and anyway, there are a lot of processes, of course, and you can buy any book or any consulting company. There's no, I mean, at the level of solutions. Because for research in the past has been focusing there, because that used to be the problem, so it was correct to focus there. Now the problem is changing at a higher level. So I will not talk about another process. We will not explore processes to find solutions. There are many, for sure. We will move one level higher. So what is the process up there to find a new direction? And in reality, we, we can compare. Let's do this. This is a classic process to find new solutions. By, we took this for probably is very popular by an American company called IDEO. They are been creating a movement called design thinking. You probably know them, very, very popular. Very creative, you can get a lot of ideas from this. Uh, and if you look at this process, basically this process has, there is a glass here, I forgot. It's to me to remember. <laughs> I can't move, and that's uh, Anyway, uh, there is a, 
a first phase, which is discover, which basically means you go out and you talk to people, you know, talk to user, customer, try to understand where is the problem. And the next step, you go back to inside your company. So you move outside of the box, go out, talk to people, then you go back and you have a lot of ideas. Okay. How does it look differently from what we saw before? Then we get into the details, but just to show the different sequence here. Let's leave awakening aside, because this is just to understand where you are. Let's, the real big first step is this one. What we will see is that when you search a new for a new direction, when you search for the meaning of things, instead of starting from going out, you start from yourself. You preempt. Preempt means you say what I believe people could love. And this is, sounds strange, but if you think carefully, it is quite meaningful. I mean, you, cannot, you can ask to solution to others, but you cannot decide a direction. Be, you cannot be dictated by a direction because someone else tells you. I mean, it's like when you choose, I want to take a degree. I have a lot of students in my university. I mean, no one can tell you if you want to become an engineer, a doctor, a lawyer. You have to decide what is meaningful in life. And you can even ask others, should I take the green engineering or a medicine? If you do this, you're lost. You start from what you believe could be meaningful. And then we will get more, much more deeper later to explain why. But there is a lot of research, not only our research, that shows that the more you go out and you ask users what, is, what they really want, the more you become incremental. There's a famous book by an American professor called Clayton Christensen called The Dilemma of, of an Innovator, in which he showed through a lot of case studies that classically, typically, customers, and especially the most advanced customer, keeps you where you are. They just want a little more than what they know. Mm -hmm. Classic example, a lot of innovation that come from Apple never come from user. At the time of BlackBerry, no one would have, would have wanted a, comp a phone without a keyboard. That's the vision. So breakthrough innovation comes from your understanding of how the world is changing. So there is first big difference. When you are at the level of solution, which is fine, you start from the user. But when you are at the level of directions, you start from yourself. <coughs> Roberto, this, yes. I know this is not in the manuscript. Yeah, uh, but I, I give you this anyway. Okay. And you, you, you can be diplomatic and not answer. But uh, we get this question sometimes that, uh, yes, nice, but I, sp I have a quote of a, of a manager at a robotic company in my head, and he said, well, if you're too visionary, you die. We had a CEO once, who were, he was very visionary, mm -hmm. and we were three weeks from bankruptcy. So it's nice, but in reality, we, we, don't, we cannot do that. We don't dare to do this that. Was not, can you close the <laughs> curtain? Because there's not in the script. So. <laughs> no, it's a joke. Uh, no, but it's, it's, it's correct. So it's, uh, we need a second principle then. And the second principle is that, of course, you start from yourself, but then you need to be critical. What does it mean need to be critical? Is that, is, you know that on Facebook, people always write, you know, do what you love. It's not like this. I mean, do what you love, yes. If you don't love it, people will never love it. But then you need to be critical of yourself, because otherwise you keep doing what you see. So I start from myself. I believe that people will love this. But then I need to go deeper and critically reflect. And I, start, I have to start from myself. There's no one else here. I have to start from my interpretation. And the trick of the process is to slowly, slowly, slowly start and see new things by going deeper and deeper. It's not a process of ideation. It's not putting there one more thing. It's a process of reframing what I see. And you can only do this through critical reflection. Critical reflection doesn't mean negative. It means by going deeper. Criticism means it's like a movie critic or like a theater critic. It's not positive or negative. It can be both. But the critic is always deeper. It helps you reflect, reflect. And slowly you turn. We will come back to that after the break. Exactly. with some cases and some exercises also. So these are the two differences. Instead of starting from the outside and moving in, you start from the inside and you move out. You meet other people after. This is my hypothesis. What do you think? Mm -hmm. And then you start to, to, to be challenged. 
And instead of putting there one more idea, you take one direction and you slowly go deeper. And as you go deeper, you turn. Okay, so it's a totally different nature. So this is what we saw. We saw a process that we will experience a little later. And the, this first part, I hope that what will remain with you is that we live in a world where there is a lot of stuff here. Be sure, whatever you search for a solution, you can easily find it. Innovation nowadays is moving up there. Mm -hmm. It's what finding the right direction, a meaningful direction. So last line now before the coffee break. I think uh, we should make a little note. Um, we've been giving you some examples that are easy to understand. They are product related. But of course, meaning is as important and relevant also in other settings, business to business settings. Uh, those of you who know me know that I sometimes talk about industrial robots. Maybe too much, but I do. I like them and, and about the meaning change of robots. We, we cannot talk about that now, but um, meaning changes, of course, also in business settings, in services. Um, we have been doing a project with Deloitte, who's doing accounting and other, other stuff, and a, a um, project on risk. So it's relevant in all type of businesses. And maybe the most extreme uh, version, extreme project that we have right now is a place where you wouldn't maybe expect that you would talk about meaning and meaning change. And it's this one. This is the cathedral in Strängnäs, Domkyrkan. And they are actually questioning now what they are doing, what they should do, what should they do to be relevant in society and be good as they are, but be relevant 2017. So this is to say that there is no, I mean, this is a very extreme example, but it's to say even this organization is reflecting about what is a new meaning in what they do. I mean, this is probably the most stable organization ever. So if they are reflecting about how the meaning of things is changing, I'm quite sure that no organization nowadays is shielded by a reflection about is it meaningful the direction we are taking now, or which the society is changing, the world is changing, and therefore, if we keep solving the same problem better, we just solve an old problem. So the point is, how can we turn and find a new direction? And we will try to explore this after the night, Fika. After the coffee break. So okay. we, will be, we will start again in, in 20 minutes, minutes, which means maybe... Five past four. Five past four. So welcome back for some uh, pussel, I would yes. say, bricolage. And, and when you come back, you will get a paper uh, that you need to have for the exercise. Two of my colleagues will be standing inside the doors. Well.
Yeah. Okay. Uh, does everyone have paper? And we have some pencil here. If if someone doesn't have, we can. Yeah. One, two, three. Okay. Anna. Hmm? Yes, we're online. Don't say strange things now. <laughs> Do you hear us? Yes. Yes. Back after the coffee. So let's be now a little bit more hands on, isn't it, Roberto? Yes. So the idea now is to practice a little uh, what we have been learning in terms of process. To summarize what we, what we say in the first part of the uh, reflection. Innovation is at two levels, the level of solution, improving things, and the latter level of meaning, changing direction, finding something that is more meaningful. And sometimes it's very interesting because the first time you change direction, typically it works less, it's it worse than it used to be, but you're going in the right direction, which is more meaningful. Uh, so we'll try to experience a little this process up there. As we said before, you can't do innovation in, in half an hour, so it's impossible. But just to give, at least to let you understand a little more of the four principles, the four practices that we have there. Okay, and then if you want to uh, know a little more, if you, you have been, this, you've been receive a paper, behind this paper there is a few references with the readings that you can find where you can find deeper description of the process, the cases that we have been doing, and so on. So uh, this is the process. Uh, and uh, so we go through these four practices very, very rapidly. <clears throat> yes. And now, to be a little bit organized, I think you all have got this paper now. And somewhere on the paper it says, uh, start here should be on one side like this. Do you find it? Yeah. So the idea now, and this is a little bit of an experiment also for us, that we will go through the practices, we'll give a little example of a case, and we will fill in some things um, during the coming half an hour. There will also be some real exercising, some reflections and so on. I will try to draw together with you on, on this one and stop Roberto um, so you don't talk all the time, so we have time to write. Okay. Uh, one more thing, we will also use our smartphones. So keep them ready, we will soon use them and try something in five, six minutes, something like this. We cross so the fingers and hope Cross the fingers, the internet <laughs> is with us today. So then we start, I think. Okay, so Straight we away. start with the first practice, awakening. Yes, thank you, Roberto. Which means awakening is something that we should write. And I have to check my faucet, as we say in Swedish. The start here is here. And in the green box now, not the top one, we write awakening. And you see the spelling there. If <laughs> you're like me, you have to check the English. Awakening, okay? The idea is that this should be your recipe, so you can bring it back home and think a little bit more about how to work. So, You can take all the notes you want to. I will just give you the, the, the keywords. Please. Okay, what does it mean, awakening? It means that whenever you start an innovation journey, the first step is to be, you know, are we aware? Do we need this? Maybe you don't need it. And if we need to change, which direction we need to change? So, where we are. And, and, uh, the story that I would like to share is a story of a company who approached us a few years ago. The company is called Nice. It's a company in the northeast of Italy. It's a conglomerate uh, listed in the stock exchange. They do electronic products for the home, like electronic gates, uh, thermostats, and all these kind of things. Impressive, a huge rapid growth in the last decades. They have been growing so fast, and at a given moment they called us and said, you know, we have been growing so fast that suddenly we discovered that we have been a little lost. You know, they are, we are so focused on 
capturing value for what they were doing. That at a given point they say, we, we are lost a little bit of direction. So we don't know exactly you know, what's the next step. So we say, OK, uh, no worries. We can do a little experiment. First of all, we want to understand what is the situation. OK, so we went there and, and we did a little experiment. We, we showed them a few photos of the meaning of the home. OK, to say you work, you do product for the home. You do thermostat, you do gates. And, and by doing this product, basically, in your mind, you imagine the home can be, for example, a nest. Where is the nest? There is a nest. The home can be a place where you become artistic. Home is a, you know, is a fortress where you feel protected. The home is something in which you, know, you want to feel in control. You have your remote control. You control all your shields and all these kind of things. So we ask, OK, we assemble a team of 50 managers, and we say to each one of them, what do you believe is the meaning of the home? What would you like to offer to people in terms of, before starting with product, as a vision of what the home is in the future. So if I would be in that project, I would have to pick the photo I like the best that represents the home for me. Yes, you pick the photo of the direction. If you work in this company, what is the home for me? Is it a museum? Is it something for a nomadic home? What is the vision? And this is what happened. Everyone picked a, a post-it, and that if, that this is the result of their analysis, which basically meant in reality, all of them has a v had a vision, which is interesting. But what they did is that each one has a different direction of where they should go. Uh -huh. That was the moment in which they, it made visible to them to say, OK, now we understand. We, it's the promise that we don't have. It's not that we don't have any vision. It's that the vision that we have is totally different among the managers in the company. And by seeing this in front of their eyes, that was the awakening moment. We need to do something to find a common direction here. I mean, okay. I remember the enthusiasm there because they were so happy to pick the photo they liked. But then when they realized they were so, so different, they were quite silent. Remember that? Yeah. It's like, okay, I didn't know you were reasoning like that. <laughs> Thought we were thinking the same. So that was the haha -ha moment. And, and now we'll do a little experiment to engage you a little. I mean, we cannot do the same now because every company has different kind of situations, so that we're good for the home. But imagine you have in front of you nine photos that are close to possible direction for your companies, okay? And there is 15 people in your team. And you ask to the people in your team, pick a photo, okay, that represents the direction we should take. And probably, these are the there are six possible situations, you can imagine. What can happen there? It can happen that no one picks anything. We don't have any idea where to go. Or maybe, maybe you can go down here. This is the situation of the company we saw before. Yeah, everyone picks a different direction. Or this is fantastic. Everyone perfectly aligned. And by the way, the blue post-it is yours, your personal post-it. Okay? Or everyone is perfectly aligned, but you are not. You are the only one who sees things different. It happens. Uh, this is a little better. Uh, you, everyone has a line. You see different things, but around you, you have a, you have a little fans. group of <laughs> renegades, yeah. you know, revolutionary people. You know, <laughs> OK, we, we under the table. We are trying to, to, to side, see a new direction. Uh, and this is the last one, which is there is people, there are renegades, but you belong to, you're saying these people look a little strange. OK? <laughs> so, now we try to see what you believe. So imagine you are in, you're in your company. You can pick your photos and your colleagues can pick a photo. Which one of these six situations you believe your organization would be? So take your phone. Yeah, now we need to tell them because now we need to take our phone. Okay, relaxed. We go to that website, polf.com slash asau. And you should see the same question and picture as before coming up. I switch now. Yes, let's hope it works. Uh, give it a second. Yes. So now oh, okay. So now you can choose what, in your case, if we would do this experiment in your company, and then you just pick the drawing you believe represent what will happen here. Okay, someone is voting there. I see the green things are you. Okay. Quite a many revolutionary people here. 
I think. I have a good thing that I believe in. I'm not alone. Many are there. I don't know how many we are, but we should have many green dots in the end. Okay. Interesting. This to me is a, quite often a start-up. Everyone is super Perfect ambitious. Line. Vision is the same. A lot of energy. No one is going somewhere else. I'm a revolutionary. Okay, let's see. Aligned. Not so many here. Ah, a few. Everyone have their own way of seeing things. Something, something 16, 17, 18. Low right looks. <laughs> Low right. <laughs> Interesting. So let's give just another 10 yeah. seconds and mm -hmm. then we can comment on this. No one is in the top left. It's, this is interesting. So we, this is a confirmation. We don't live in a world that is poor in ideas. For sure, everyone has a preference there. This, okay. would, this would be the case when uh, people don't have time. No one participates. <laughs> yeah, you do no other stuff. You get the survey there. <laughs> but that's you, a company where no one has a phone. You maybe. do something else. Yeah. Or the Wi-Fi doesn't work. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so good. I mean, it's very interesting. Uh, we don't have, of course, time now to discuss all the situation. And we, it would be nice to do it seriously with us. Uh, just, we can just give you a comment on this situation. I see that most of you are on the lower right, which is quite interesting. That's a classic situation in which uh, there is a group, uh, we call them a radical circle, okay, on the lower right, okay. I'm a revolutionary, so a classic situation, what we call a radical circle, in which a few people start to see a new, new direction. And I can tell you, uh, uh, it's sometime in this situation, someone starts to say, you know, who is right and who is wrong. And the reality, if we think about what we said earlier and what we would say now, is that no one is right and no one is wrong. But that's the most interesting point. There is two groups of people who see things in a different way. We can exploit this different perspective to go in search of a new direction, which is neither the first one and nor the second one. But there is something there. And we always start from the assumption that if people see different things, it's not that one is right or other wrong. It's that there is something behind that we need to go and search. And that's what will happen later, is the critical reflection. But that's an interesting signal. If you are in a situation like this, it means that the existing direction is not completely aligned with how the world is going. There is something there that we need to explore. OK. And uh, I see your, yours. I see you want to change to another second practice, and I want to give them a keyword. Okay. So, we will write something more here just to remember this when we look at this another day. So, I will, we will write assessing because it's somehow so that you wake up, but you quite often wake up because you assess. Assessing. Somehow you do something that assesses you and you see that clearly and that is an aha moment. Now we will move a little bit here. And by the way, if you're interested to know a little more or, or send what... Send us a mail. Send us a mail. We, can, we are doing projects about how you can really measure the situation in an organization and see alignment and misalignment around what is meaningful and what is not. Okay? So uh, definitely we are always open to cooperate. Mm -hmm. um, second step. Second step, Roberto. Second step is what we call preempting. Okay, so guys, next green square, we write preempting there. Fine. Okay. What do we mean by preempting? It means that, okay, we understand that people is going different direction. There is something there that we need to search for. Okay, the first step is to take out what each one of this team of 15 people see in reality, okay? 
And this is always important because oh, even when we go out and we start to collect information, studying users, studying customers, we always have something inside. We believe we are listening to someone. In reality, there is something inside us that is a framework that makes us listen what we want to listen. So what we do, okay, let's take out the framework first, let express where we believe people should go, and then we will challenge this later. But first step is let's put everything on the table, pre and what we have inside. A little example, we have been working with a company, I think they sold, sell products also in Sweden. We can even make some advertisement because they are friends. This Mutis is the best brand in, in uh, tomato sauce. Of course, it's Italian. <coughs> uh, in, Sweden you buy, in Sweden, you buy them because the, the tin is nice. Yes, and you keep them in the kitchen as this, you know, decorations. It looks like my grandma's you mm. know, can. And, and anyway, uh, they have a motto which is called Solo Pomodoro. Solo Pomodoro means only tomato. They only do tomato sauce. And they came to us and said, this is great, but what's the next step? And <laughs> I can tell you it's not easy because they, they, they are proud of being only tomato. I mean, this is the brand. We are great because we only do tomatoes. They right. own the fields, they control everything perfectly, perfect quality. So what's the next step? And, uh, and you can imagine, you can have thousands of ideas. I mean, we can take them to Politecnico, invite our students to be creative. They can receive in, well, millions of ideas about what's the next step in food. Uh, what we did instead, we assembled a team of managers and, and designers inside, again, 15 people, and said, okay, what do you believe? Before even getting an idea, what do you believe is the right direction for our organization? And uh, to, to help this, we give them a ho little homework. We give them one month to do this homework. And the homework was, imagine that uh, in two years, this project will be over, we will have new products in the market, and this project will be so successful that you know that the Times every year makes the person of the year? Okay, the person of the year is the tomato. Because, uh, you know, sometimes they use products, you know, they used to be the computer, all the, so it's the tomato. Why? Why we will get there? I don't want to know the product, I want to know why we will be capable through this project to change the meaning of how people eat, and especially about why people eat tomatoes. So we gave them this form and one month to reflect. You say, why Actually, we also, we, what we always do, we didn't say that, but we, we also took time with them one and one Sometimes. in the beginning and halfway through to talk to them. Because, of course, when you have a homework, you do it maybe a little bit too late. This so we had quite nice reflection with them, each and every one, halfway. Because yeah. they were like, tomatoes are like tomatoes are. What should I do? So, so nice discussion on the way there. This is typical of design school, you know, you give a homework, then you mm. have a meeting with professor, you discuss, and this is the classic critical reflection, mm. okay? This is, for example, something one of the members of the team did. There's no product there, okay? But you see the direction. And I can it's show nice. you this because this yeah. was not the final direction. But this is the direction this person saw, okay, tomato, why? You know, what is the direction we need to take? And this person said, you know, we understand that, and, and that in our society, uh, people is searching for healthy food, especially healthy food on the go. It's easy to eat healthy, easy. You can eat healthy at home, mm. but when you're on the streets, it's always difficult. Typically, you find tomato chips or uh, popcorn or these stupid things. Okay, why don't we bring tomato as the new chip of the 21st century? And this is such, you know, the, the myth of tomato chips is one of the most popular food ever. We will get to the cover of the time because the tomato has taken the place of the cheap. It's the new symbol of a society that is moving and is healthy. Okay, now we see the direction. There's no product yet, but we want to have, now we have, can have millions of ideas, but we have a direction. Okay, so this is what we say preempted. This is what this person believes in. I can tell you, if we take this person and I can make this person make a thousand interviews, he will always listen to this. Okay, yeah, you see, you see, healthy on the go. Maybe the people see a million other things, but if you have this thing inside, you listen to this thing, and it's good. It's what you have, is your interpretation of the word. We want to see it and take it out. Mm -hmm. And uh, this time we will not use the phone. It There's was no phone here. Too, too tough for us to use the technology. 
But we will just do something very simple. We will take a moment, a minute or two to reflect. And just think about when was the last time that you took time for yourself to reflect, sit down and reflect without the phone and the TV and all the stuff around you? Did you do it alone or did you have someone else there? And when do you plan to do that the next time? There is not so much space, but just you have a little space here on the side of preempting. Just take a second, a minute, think about this, make a note or two. And we stay silent. So when was the last time you did something like this? Took time to reflect on what is meaningful for your organization. Not just a solution, but a new meaningful direction. And when do you plan to do it next? Okay, just a little note here. Uh, the reason why we gave a month to do this a homework that looks very simple. How much does it take to make this to fill to fill in this form? Thirty seconds. It's not the time to fill in the form. It's the time of reflection that is important. And it, I, I want to underline one thing here that is very important. In the last fifteen years, especially in the world of design, what is called design thinking and so on, we have been always show this myth of the brainstorming, the workshop, and you come here, you do a workshop, and one day you will change your company. Mm. It's not like this. But it's not like this in the sense that a lot of research scientifically demonstrates that brainstorming doesn't work. It's scientifically demonstrated. You feel good because when, after one day spent doing creative, you feel good, but nothing happens after that. Okay? And the reason is that our brain is designed in a way that if I ask you a few ideas about tomato sauces, I'm sure you take out, take out something. Because in reality, creativity is, it means to pull out things from your brain. It's in your memory. You don't create. You just go down and search for something and take it out. And if I give you an hour or a day, you, of course you go down a little. But if I give you a month, after one day you have been taking out the classic things, but after two days, three days, and you talk to someone else and you say, yes, but I don't really understand, then you are forced to go down. And our brain is a little lazy. It needs to be pushed <coughs> to go down and no. excavate and go deeper, okay? I'm talking so, about, yeah. So when you need time no. to take out the real one, one, only one, real direction. Mm. Talking about the brain, I didn't know you would say that, so I picked up <laughs> that now. Uh, we will do a little ad additional note on our papers here, and uh, that, that's the principle. It's the inside-out principle from the inside, and you take it out. And this is not so obvious, of course. Uh, you can do it with a good friend, someone that you, you know will not uh, say nasty things to you. So uh, it's not obvious to do it. That's why we underline that it takes time and you have to be comfortable. So just, we'll, we just make a note here. We write inside out. Inside out as a principle. Sometimes I also say you have to unbutton your shirt a bit, open up there to say your things, even if they are not politically correct in your organization. Okay. We move on. So the first thing was to awaken, to engage, to understand do we need this, don't we need this, and what, you know, is this something that is for us or not? Second, okay, what's the first step? First I need to take out what is my vision of how the world is changing. I believe that the world needs more food that is healthy, especially on the go. Okay, that's the direction, direction in which I believe. And if you believe in this, there's nothing that can stop you. Okay, now, however, if things start from the inside out, now we need to be sure that if we love it, also people will love it. And it doesn't mean that everything we love, people will love. So we need to be a little challenged, otherwise we keep going the same direction. And the best way to be challenged is to use 
critical reflection. And there are many ways in which you can do critical reflection, but typically there are no tools here, unfortunately. There are no three steps to be critical to yourself. The only way to be critical to yourself is to meet other people. And it's now we make a break, because we were Sorry. criticizing. That's, <laughs> okay. that's the reason why we are in two, because we need to <laughs> criticize each other. That alone I cannot make it. Sorry. Third square, <laughs> okay, the green square, and we write criticizing. Uh, well, it will have to be like this then. Criticizing. We take a case also to yes. exemplify this. So, let us say, the best way to reflect critically is to do it with someone else. There are many ways in which you can do it with someone else. A classic way is what we are doing now, now by the way, is, is to find a pair, a sparring partner that can also punch you sometime because it makes you think differently. Another way is to go and meet outsiders, some ones you rarely meet. These outsiders, we call them interpreters. Okay, so who are these people you want to meet? You see something, but I want to meet someone else that can challenge me and help me to understand what I see is really true. Or maybe I still go in the same direction, but I understand something even myself I couldn't pick. So I need to be challenged by someone else. And we call this someone else the interpreters. The interpreter is someone else, if this is me, and this is my customer, my you know, people in which I want to give these beautiful tomato chips that are healthy on the go. Okay, I believe that people will love this, but is it really true? Or can I give, go a little deeper and do it better? So I need to meet someone else who look at the same customer from different perspective. So when we talk about interpreters, someone else, we don't say just talk to someone and talk to a clown. Why? I don't know. It's a different person. No. You need to meet someone else. Again, in a world that is overcrowded by people, you need the direction to find the right someone else. And someone else is someone else who's looking at your same user from different perspectives. So let's take an example. You've been doing like, a few projects with Gucci, uh, uh, especially on the retail experience. And uh, this is, uh, we organize meeting with interpreters. Uh, and this is uh, a, a few interpreters that Gucci has met along a process of change in direction. So you can imagine, same thing that happened with Muti. I don't know why we're only using Italian companies here. But anyway. Uh, but I tried to uh, tell yeah. the Swedish one, or the Dutch one, sorry. It's fine. Anyway. I like this one. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, and uh, so you can imagine, like in Muti, Take out what you have inside. So everyone in Gucci said, okay, I believe that the, the shopping experience in a Gucci store should be something that gives this meaning to people. Learning, discovering the history of Italy, whatever. Then, to be sure that the direction we see is right, we help them meet some interpreters. Who are these interpreters? As you can see, imagine there is a person, a, a girl or a guy, who buy a pair of boots from Gucci. Why this person buy this pair of goods? Because maybe tonight, this person will have a dinner. Okay? He wants to spend a nice night out with his girlfriend or boyfriend. So, in reality, the same person that buys a pair of shoes from, uh, from Gucci, the, the, the same night, he will go to a restaurant. So, a restaurant owner is participating to the same experience of Gucci. Gucci provides the shoes, the restaurant owner provides the food, but the customer is the same. And when we enter into a Gucci store, when I enter into a Gucci store, I'm the same person that then, after half an hour, I go to the restaurant and take my booth there because I want to have a nice night. And maybe after the dinner, I go to an hotel, and maybe during the dinner, I will drink some San Pellegrino water, and maybe I will take some photos, and I will post it on Facebook, and maybe I want to be fit when I go to the restaurant. So Techno Gym is doing, you know, uh, um, machines Gyms. for training. Mm. It's participating to the same experience. Gucci provide the shoes, Technogene provide me the muscles. Okay, but we are all around that. Are, they are all looking at the same users. And of course, the, a, a Buddhist priest also may, has me, makes me feel a little, little less guilty when I come back home. Okay, so uh, all this interpreter can help Gucci see the same customer, what is meaningful for, this, for the same customer from different perspectives. So in this case, Gucci went there and say, okay, we believe that people would like to go in that direction. What do you think? And these are not competitors, so it's not a sensitive kind of discussion. 
It's a close conversation inside the room, and everyone challenges each other. And they are so happy to come, by the way, that they come all for free, because it's a very deep conversation. Of course, also, San Pellegrino is curious to know what Gucci believe about why, why, how people would love to have a nice night. A Swedish note on this. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking about this now. Uh, we have just been doing this with the Swedish church, actually. Yeah. And they had, had to understand who are the interpreters that can help us. What is our... What is the person in the middle? What is the experience that we think of? In this case, the church wanted... Uh, they, had a, they have a project on learning. So they had to relate to experts that have something to do with learning, but from different perspectives who are not anyway connected to this church. For example, they had people coming from Tom Titz, which I think, you know, it's a place to learn, but has nothing to do with the church. So the exercise for the Swedish church has been now to understand who are these six, seven, eight interpreters that can challenge us and know how people want to learn, especially young children and teenagers. I mean, connecting Gucci to the church, I have to say it's a little... I know. <laughs> But Last and, and okay. Uh, we, okay. By the way, we, with the, the Gucci people actually did two interpreters lab. Oh, wait, there was a Buddhist priest. That's the, right. Yeah, it's, there it's was fine. Yeah. So, so, so was, no, there is some there. connection there. They had a Buddhist priest also okay. in their okay. interpreter lab. So uh, the exercise now is for you to think about interpreters. Who could be interpreters for you? List three that you haven't met but you would wish to meet that could challenge you, that somehow relate to the experience you're trying to create at your work. Some overlap, but not in your field, not in your business. I um, suggest we take another minute of just yeah. reflecting on this. Just a little comment to help you. If you see there, Gucci could have... So, you know, they, the first idea is, let's talk to a fashion blogger. But this is already in their network. So the idea, the idea was really to meet someone who talk to the same customer that is totally outside of the classic hmm. you know, people they meet along the way. So they never talked to Technogym before. Hmm. But yet Technogym is talking to the same user. Okay? Who are three possible interpreters you would like to meet in the future that can help you see things in a new way? So this was the question, and this now we move question. to the last one. Uh, we will just make a little note on our recipe. So let's write. Ah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> let's write interpreters here as a note for ourselves. In the interpreters, interpreters, tolkare in Swedish, people who do interpretations. So last, last one. Last practice. The last practice is what we call embodying. Oh, now I'm the late one. Okay, you all know. Embodying, okay. Embodying. And embodying, what does it mean? It means when you work at the level of solutions, I don't know, you're searching for a battery that makes a phone last longer or you have a better way to uncork a core from a bottle. I mean, you find a solution, it's fine. But when you search a new direction, when you try to change what is meaningful in food or in fashion or in religion or whatever, you cannot change the direction without changing yourself. It's not something you say, okay, we go there, but I stay here. <laughs> I mean, changing direction means you also change. Okay, so embody means that you cannot change without changing yourself. And the best example is uh, probably Finally, not an, not an Italian company. We did a big project with Gillette a few years ago. Uh, and I still smile because the first time I met the, the R&D manager of Gillette, he looked at me and said, 
There is something wrong there. <laughs> and I was trying to explain all my frustration because, uh, you know, uh, I'm in midlife crisis, so you, you don't want to get old. So you try to be young, and be young, you try to look at the young guys. All the young guys don't have, I mean, they have a beard. And so I don't want to shave myself because the only thing you can do with the Gillette razor is to, what you say, is clean shave. There's nothing else you can do, only clean shave. And, and so it was not easy to find a new direction because they were searching for innovation. You can imagine you can have five blades, six blades, seven blades, the, the, <laughs> all the crazy thing, the soft, long, but always in the same direction. How can you get better clean shaved? So when they came to us and say, maybe more than this is difficult. I mean, more clean shade than that, you cannot really cut away the skin. So let's say, what is the new direction there? And so we work a lot, and we cannot tell you the result of the project because this is still under development. Uh, but I can show you this photo. To me, this is a great photo. Uh, <laughs> you can recognize a pair of, couple of people there, maybe. Uh, Don't look but, too close. <laughs> but, it was a great photo because you can see that after, at the end of the project, they embodied the change. So this is the guy who told me, you know what, there is something strange there. <coughs> and that photo for me is a such strange, ah, the biggest mustache ever. Okay. That can be changed. And you cannot go in, it's so fun because after we did this project, they couldn't really get back. I mean, when, they, when now this team of people think about clean shaving, they will never tell to a person there is something wrong there. They have embodied the change. Okay. I think we have also seen this in many other projects. When, uh, when you ask, for example, Piotr, the, the, the Polish CEO who did the bed, we said, so why did you do it in the end? And mm, he didn't really answer. He could just say, I just felt it. I just felt it. And it's been the same in many projects. Mm, I feel it's right. It should be like this. So this team, no, sorry. this team, um, when they finally decided where to go, and you try to ask them why, they were always relating to. I just feel it. It's like this. We've been discussing so much. I feel it here. So we didn't know what to do with you for this <coughs> this part of the exercising, but you have already concluded, of course, that this one can be folded as a box. You have to think a bit, but there is an instruction there on the back. You need to write feeling maybe before. Oh, yes. Now I'm, a lo I'm, I'm late now. So the, the thing we wanted to say here is that embodying has to do with feeling it, doing it, feeling it inside, and not always being rational and talk about it, but you have to do it. So uh, our little note here now will be feel it. Only feel it. Um, we will see how many boxes we get in the end. I have one that is a little bit damaged there. So when we leave today, maybe we will have a few boxes ready. So we are, em we are embodying the seminar now. Yeah, we are embodying the seminar. Inside the box. And you can do it now or later. To see, to why, start why? straight away. Yeah, yeah it's, nice. Yeah, it's nice. So, so as you fold your box, uh, we can maybe, meanwhile, so what, what do you think? We give time to fold the box, we summarize? Well, we can maybe say something. I see that you want to fold it. So, but the idea here was to say, what can we do? What kind of seminar should we do for these people that makes them remember this and try it? And we should leave them something, some kind of gift maybe in the end. Then we said, okay, if, if everyone folds their box, maybe they will keep it a few days somewhere on their desk and remember this. That was the idea, and remember that it comes from the inside. Then you can unfold and take it out. Okay, so summary, as you fold your box. Summary, what we have been seeing today is that, again, innovation is moving, that big channel of innovation is moving at the level of meaning, finding direction. And what we have been seeing, that there is a process to search for meaning in an organization, but this process is totally different than the process you use down there. When you work at the level of solution, you start from the outside, from customers, do your analysis, and then you come back inside and you try to be creative and find ideas. I think this is also necessary if you're doing a tennis racket. I don't know if that is English, tennis racket. Mm -hmm. If you work on ergonomics, of course you have to talk to the user. It's ridiculous if you believe it's only me in my head. 
when you have to work on functions, you have to work like this. So it's in many 90% of a company's time they have to do this. It's not that that should be taken away, but it's it's not always that you should spend your time there. But uh, when the world changes around us, the point is not to do better in the same direction, it's to find a more meaningful direction in a world that is changing. And when you move up there, the process is exactly the opposite. You start from what is your interpretation, you start from the inside. I believe that people will love this. But then, then you need to be critical, otherwise you keep going the same direction. And basically, the mindset that we always represent when we want to summarize with a metaphor this way of thinking is the, meta is the metaphor of the gift. What is the metaphor of the gift? The gift is classic, the way you think when you want people to fall in love. You, know, you love a person and you want this person to love this gift. How do you think when you make a gift? First, you don't start from the user. You don't call your wife, hello, what do you want for Christmas? Yes, I would like to have an iPhone 7, you know, blue or white. She will take it, but she will never love it. <laughs> Isn't it? Right, come on, you can do a little better than this. And we don't realize, when we start from users, we don't realize that users think like this. Okay, you ask me, but come on, you are the expert. You can do a little more than this than asking myself what I want. <laughs> I mean, nowadays it's easy to do that. So, so when we ser search to make a gift, we start from our interpretation of what she could love. This is the first principle. The second, however, then we need to be critical. I mean, if I love Pink Floyd psychedelic music from the 70s, I don't give her a full collection of vinyl disc record for Pink Floyd from the 70s. Okay, it comes from me, but it's for her. That's the critical reflection. Okay, if you combine this way of being, you start from you, but then you're critical, chances that you make people, things that people love, increase a lot. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, we have time for some questions. I, if you wave your hands, we will come with the microphone. They are totally okay. into their folders. Yes. <laughs> I don't see anything. There's one here. I can put here. This. Hi. Uh, well, that's a good question. <laughs> Hi. Um, what you're describing is quite a big change in sort of the product portfolio and so on, where, where you're going. And that is obviously related to the risk. And because you need to sort of fulfill the expectation of shareholders, etc. How do you overcome that hinder? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I, I can take this because I have a very strong personal perspective on the problem of risk and innovation. And uh, we have been doing research and innovation for such a long, and classically risk is, is one of the things that come out when you do innovation because it's true, when you change, there is a risk. And I would say two things here. The first one is that uh, it is true, there is risk. My feeling that nowadays we live in a world that wherever you turn, there is risk anywhere, even if you stay where you are. I always take an example. I don't know if you know the Nintendo Wii. The Nintendo Wii was this uh, uh, famous game console which you play by moving, which is a new meaning. Instead of playing by uh, you know, entering into a virtual world, and being unsocial, you play by socializing with others and moving. In reality, this product is made possible by a component which is called accelerometer. It's a MEMS component. It's, it's the same thing you have inside your phone that is sensitive to movement. So inside the remote control, there is a component. And the company doing this component is called ST Microelectronics. They went to Microsoft first, proposing the same experience, and Microsoft said no. Why not? Because teenagers want to have more virtual reality. And that was Microsoft did with the Xbox 360. Nintendo was desperate. They were desperately looking for something new, and then they went in that direction. So nowadays, we can say, of course, who took the biggest risk? Microsoft. 
I mean, it's easy after work, <laughs> so it's easy. But this is to say simply that whatever we do today, if we change, we change a lot, we change a small, we stay where we are, there is risk everywhere. And my advice always to executives to say, forget about risk, because whatever you do, there is risk. So you, need to, you need to be good in managing this. The second comment, it is a little more subtle, is that uh, I was with a team of people from Nestle last year. We went to a trip in, 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 uh, in Berlin to show them a few startups. People, is, a corporation are intrigued by startups. And, and they went there, and these startups were saying, you know what, we have a culture of risk. And I was smiling, because this is classic ex post interpretation. But if you talk to an entrepreneur, he never talks about risk in reality. He just has to do it. And in reality, that's the point. If you really feel something, that's the principle of embodiment. If you really feel something, people from the outside feel it, you're totally crazy. But from the inside, you say, no, you are crazy. I mean, I, I can't do anything. So risk is a very touchy, touchy subject. So I always try to see that whenever people in, in, in a team say, yeah, but that's too risky, that's, I take this always as an alibi, or even worse, I have this great idea, but my company don't believe in this because it's too risky. Well, maybe that's not the problem. The problem is that the idea is not good or you didn't manage to engage the organization. Mm -hmm. So I always try to say, forget about risk and innovation. I understand the question, but it's a little provocative to say, forget about risk, because in any case there is risk. And when you really embody a change, you don't see risk anymore. You just want to do it. I think also that you, you have the companies we have been studying and working with, they, they have already decided that now we will take a part of our business or, or a part of our market and we will do something that will be risky. The rest of the business will be here and we will work on it. But they start from that perspective that, okay, these things we will do here might be high risk, but we need that kind of products also in, in, our, in our place. So Th there is a, just to add a little thing on, mm -hmm. because you say the word that is very important, you say shareholders. And shareholders yeah. are very sensitive, unfortunately, to this. There is a great article uh, on the last number of Harvard Business Review that talks about the big mistake of shareholder value. I advise you to go and read this. It's a great, great article from two professors at Harvard Business School. Uh, in business school, we have been teaching shareholder value as the driver of management behavior for almost 40 years. And they show that legally, not only theoretically, but legally is a wrong theory. And he talks from moving from shareholder value to corporate value, because it demonstrates how shareholders hold, nowadays shareholders hold the shares of a company for maybe three weeks on the average. Mm -hmm. It's true. So should we really listen and we should, should we make companies thrive through owners who own shares for three weeks? That theory is totally wrong, of course. And it's also legally wrong because it demonstrates that legally shareholders are not the owner of the company. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There was a question there, yes. Yeah. Gentleman. So when you have these people that you put together in that lab, the interpreter lab, uh, you said that that's scient uh, unscientific. Um, you said it as a reflection. But you could still do that, right? You can do it, and it's, uh, it's a qualitative thing. And mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Yes, uh, I, the, the word scientific and unscientific in this moment is very difficult. <laughs> okay. it, the, the body scientific is quite question, you know, probably because of many reasons. Uh, it, it, what I can only say, it doesn't mean that if it's qualitative, it's not scientific. If it's not quantitative, it's totally right. It's not quantitative. Uh, it would be nice, and we try, of course, because we work in research, to find more quantitative way to do this. And we, for example, in the assessment phase, we try to be a little more quantitative in this moment. Uh, Sometimes companies tell us, can we use data? In this moment, uh, it's very popular to talk about data analytics. Uh, and and we, are we are intrigued by this, of course, if you can use data to... But there are two ways in which you can use data. One way is to use the data to find out something. Okay, so I have data about customers, and this data will tell me something. That to me is not very, I mean, not, it can be good for finding a solution, but not to find a direction. 
What can be interesting instead is to use data to challenge my vision. So I see this, and now I try to see if the data support or not. Not because I want to be true or not, but just because it helped me to reflect further. Okay, the data says this, I say this, mm, why? And in the moment in which I ask myself why, it's more than enough. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, we, <laughs> and, and on, on the note on qualitative, uh, we come from different traditions, you and me. So my works more, I mean, we, we have mixed our methods over the years, I think. So we have both the quantitative perspective, but most of the things that we do in the interpreters lab is qualitative. Uh, so I'm the wrong one here because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm no, an engineer. No, I'm not saying this. I didn't even say engineer, <laughs> nothing, regression analysis yes, and so. But uh, we quite a lot also discuss the methods so that we don't become totally passionate for qualitative, even if we are more there than on the quantitative scale. So now we are challenging ourselves, I would say, because we're trying to see if meaning, as subjective as it is, is something that you could use in the quantitative setting. Uh, I, my, I'm personally a little bit scared what will happen, but we, we, I think that's what we try to do all the time. We try to mix the different methods. and. Uh, all input there is more than welcome, I would say. Thank you. Time flies. It's five o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> and we are in Already Sweden. It does. <laughs> yes. uh, thank you so much. Uh, we have some Swedish uh, recycled design wow. for you. And all, we also support uh, UNICEF School in the Box. So we mm -hmm. disseminate mm -hmm. research or, or knowledge in different ways. Wow. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. You have won it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Great. And thank you. Good night. <laughs> this should be in your set.